Good morning and welcome to L University. My name is Reverend Ezekiel. Now, I did want to touch upon the right to travel thing one more time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to my YouTube channel uh, and check out the right to travel videos. Uh, I just wanted to say this. You saw Paul handle that correctly. Now, I've been on the other side of that and handled it incorrectly. All right, and it resulted to me in me going to jail. So it can go both ways. I uh, went, I used some advice that was given to me that I knew ultimately in the back of my mind didn't make sense. And, and so I, even though I went ahead and did, so I went ahead and did it anyway, uh, unfortunately for me, and it didn't work out that way. There can be no controversy, just remember that. If you create a controversy, then you're going to have problems. In my situation, I created a controversy because I wasn't willing to cooperate. I, I kept citing UCC 1308 and that I didn't want a contract, just like I had read in a book. And I only cracked my window about that much. And the officer, it was a deputy sheriff, he gave me the, um, he gave me many opportunities to roll my window down and discuss it. He even said, you know, it's a busy highway, just come out, uh, jump out of your car and come up front and let's talk. And I, you know, I just kind of, to some degree, and you notice Paul too, felt this way that he was trying to trick me. So I was really worried and I figured I was safest in my vehicle. Uh, a few more attempts were made. He put spikes under my rear tires, make sure I couldn't drive off. I wasn't going to. I had turned it, uh, the vehicle off anyway. But he put uh, spikes under the tires, and he said, look, if you don't get out now, I'm going to take this pin, and I'm going to bust your window out, and then I'm going to drag you out of the vehicle. And uh, I said, I, I just kept going with, I do not wish to contract, uh, blah, blah, blah. He put that thing right to my window, smashed it out, unlocked the door. I wasn't resisting, so he didn't do anything violent to me, but he removed me from the vehicle took me uh, to the squad car, and when we got there, he said, I gave you every opportunity to cooperate, and you refused, you're under arrest, do you understand? And I said, I overstand. And at that point, I ended up head first uh, on the ground, okay? Again, like I have said before as well, respect and watching what you're saying. Yeah, it might be overstand, it might be understand, it might be understand. The bottom line is, is if you, if you insultingly go against what they believe to be true, they're gonna take it as an insult, and they're gonna hurt you, or they're gonna try to whatever. So avoid that. Now, since then, I don't play any games. Like I had mentioned in my previous videos, there is a way that you can get that, uh, that you can get that taken care of, that right to travel, uh, and, and you can move freely. You can get it. I'll just, get, I'll just give, give up the game. You can get a de, uh, do not detain injunction. You can go to your local courthouse with a do not detain injunction. And you can get one so that when you hand your paperwork to the officer or the agent of the matrix, they see that it's from their court. And they will not detain you. They'll read the paperwork. Whereas if you just come up with a sheet that you print, just like you heard the officer say to Paul, that he just printed that out. Now that officer uh, was smart and he obviously wasn't as militarized as most officers are these days and was willing to hear him out. And a, a lot of cops will, honestly, if you cooperate. And if you're respectful and you're just talking with them. Because at the end of the day, they're clocking in and clocking out. It's a corporation. They're trying to feed their families. Uh, some might be more vindictive than others. But the fact of the matter is they're just trying to get home too. And if you make their day interesting in a bad way, they're going to make yours interesting as well. Right now, uh, I gave up the game. That's how you do it. That's how I do it. So if I am pulled over, now people in my town, they all know me. So why would they pull me over? They know what I am. They know how I operate. So they don't. They leave me alone. And they act like I don't even exist. And nobody else says anything because it's cognitive dissonance. They see you driving around without a plate. And the only thing they're thinking is, oh man, that dude's about to get cracked. And then they never think about you again. The officers, they just let you go on your way because they know who you are, then they're going to let you go. I do not have a driver's license. I do not have a state ID. I do not have insurance. Okay, I'm bonded, and I can discuss that with you in L University as well, where you can bond yourself. And it is important. It's not required, but if you get hurt, that bond's going to cover all types of situations, and it's not a situation where you're paying every month. The bond is able to be cashed out if it's needed. All right, it's, it, the, the credit, because it's ultimately credit, is there already. But again, moving forward, I'm able to travel in that right without problems. If I move into the jurisdiction of another state, I may get pulled over. But just like you saw with Paul, they're gonna, they're, if I'm going to cooperate, they're at least going to take a look at my paperwork. If I'm willing to get out of the car and, and walk over and talk to them, they didn't make him get out. But they can. And you may as well. The, the officers that were detaining me asked me to get out of the car and to come up front, out, off the street. It was a busy highway. If I had, and he even said to me, if you had just got out of the car, I would have took you over here and talked to you, and then I would have told you what our rules are in our municipality and sent you on your way. 
But instead, you got an attitude, you disrespect me, and now you're going to jail. Think about that. You think I'm lying, but you saw the video, okay? If you think I'm lying. You saw that video, and it is the truth. And, it's, and if, you, if you spoke with a judge or an officer of any type, uh, not even in your vehicle, but saw one, because you can walk right up to a cop on the streets. I don't know if you know that, but you can say, excuse me, officer, and you can talk to them pretty much about anything you want. That, that's what they're there for. That's what they're actually there for, is things like that. So you go up and say, da-da-da-da-da, and he's going to advise you that you might have some problems. He's going to say this, this, and this, but he'll look over your cases, and at the end of the day, he's going to give you a solid verdict. He's probably going to tell you it depends on the situation. You know, if you again, if you have a DUI, let's say you had a driver's license, all right, already, and you got a DUI, I use that because that's a big one why people are trying to use it. They're going to say that you agreed to their rules by getting the driver's license. Okay, and then now that you were penalized and it was taken away, you're trying to get out of the system. And they're not going to let you do that. Okay, they're going to fight you. You might be able to take it all the way and win in the end because you have the right to travel, but they're going to make you fight it all the way. So, if you, again, if you have something like that, you have to try to get that squared away. If you have nothing, then they, they're not taking you to jail. If you have nothing on your record, they're not taking you to jail. Not unless you're, you're uh, antagonistic, you're uncooperative. Things of that nature. Otherwise, you're not going to jail. At worst, you're getting a ticket, which you would be able to not, not, this isn't even a matter of discharging the fine. It's a matter of proving that the person had no jurisdiction or authority to pull you over and give you the ticket to begin with. It has nothing to do with a CAFB. Not that. Okay, so having said all that, if you need some help on that do not detain, hit me up. If you just want to do it on your own, remember what I said and be cautious and be cooperative and do not create a dispute. And if you got some sort of reason that your license was taken, expect problems. Excuse me, my mouth's a little dry. All right, so let's get through this. Having said all that with the DUI and things like that, leads right in to today's topic. We're going to talk about res. And res is the real substance of a thing, what it really is, all right? And we're going to talk about mens rea, which is intent in the law, okay? It literally means guilty mind. In the law, in order to be guilty of a crime, you have to have a guilty mind. You have to have meant to perpetrate the crime, okay? If they can't prove intent, then they have a very, very hard time proving guilt, all right? I want to read a little bit about mens rea um, from my notes, and then we'll move right along. Mens rea refers to criminal intent. The literal translation from Latin is guilty mind. And the plural of mens rea is mentes rea. A mens rea refers to the state of mind statutorily required in order to convict a particular defendant of a particular crime. See Staples versus United States, 511 U.S. 600, 1994. Now, I had someone on my YouTube channel make a big deal about case law and said, oh, you're saying case law trumps the Constitution. Absolutely not. The case law doesn't trump the Constitution, but case law defines the state of the law. It decides it. That's the way it works. So if there's anything that's not clear in the Constitution, then the courts define it. Case law is the ruling law in our land. Know that. At the end of the day, the judiciary decides everything. You take a basic superior court, court of appeals, state supreme court uh, uh, structure, and you look at it like this. The superior court is to mete out justice. That's what they're there for. They're supposed to handle all those cases and mete out justice. The court of appeals exists to affirm the superior court's decision. That means their job is to deny the appeal. If they can find a way. Allegedly, it has to be lawful and all that good stuff, but that is their job, to uphold the lower court's decision. And what's the state Supreme Court's job? To define the state of the law. So let's say you have a uh, Court of, of Appeals, Division One, Two, II, and Three. okay? Division One says such as, this is what happened with that State versus Smith case, by the way, with the juvenile uh, points that I told you about, uh, where I helped the kid. Now, what happened is Division One said that, that the situation, I'll just give you in a nutshell, that any uh, crime that a juvenile commits before the age of 15 automatically washes on the, a, on the day he turns 15. It's not a, turn eight, a, a situation of turning 18 and getting your record sealed. It's an automatic wash based on their law. Okay? 
So uh, they weren't doing that. They were never honoring that, and they were giving kids buku points. It didn't matter if they were 10, okay? So Division One says, basically, and I, I don't remember it all this many, almost 20 years ago. So basically, Division One said, with respect to juvenile points, it, it, this is what's done. Division Three essentially agreed with Division One, and Division Two said, no way, you got to do it, which was essentially the right way. Okay, and, and again, remember that this, the higher courts and it's the state Supreme Court in the state and the U.S. Supreme Court in the United States, uh, d um, they will allow a lot of damage to occur before they will sit in and decide the state of the law. They basically have to have uh, the conflict. Okay, without the conflict, there's no power. Right. I believe. Look, it is the controversy that brings life into the action of the courts. No controversy, no need for a judicial decision. Just like the Roe v. Wade thing. You want, uh, you believe in right to choose, you don't believe in right to choose, but Roe v. Wade or, or Jackson v. Dobbs gets to decide it. They get to determine, determine what's going to happen based on the controversy. They are empowered by it. Okay? So Division One, Division Three said this, Division Two said this, and finally, after a whole lot of damage later, the State Supreme Court in State v. Smith said, no. It washes at 15, no matter what, and it's an adjudication, not a conviction. It can never be used as a point, ever. It's an adjudication. It's administrative, not judicial. Okay? Children are tried under an administrative judge. They're not entitled to a jury. Uh, a jury. Okay? A lot of people don't, don't know that. But whereas an adult, is, he gets the jury of his peers, allegedly. It's supposed to be your peers. They're supposed to know you. That's not what they're doing today, but they're giving you the, the, the jurors or whatever. That's not the case in a juvenile case because juveniles are under administrative court, not judicial. There's a huge difference. Now, I did want to say about this mens rea and what I'm quoting uh, back, back to the case law is case law defines the state. So State versus Smith said, this is what it is. This is what it is. And all the other courts and all the judges across the state had to do that. They, now that they understand the state of the law and it's been spelled out for them, they're doing it unless they ultimately they'll create a new law and then start it all over again. All right. Well, one uh, example of that is where prisoners were being allowed to make uh, minimum wage or more in certain industry situations. And uh, the people, citizens of the state sued the Department of Corrections, uh, saying that they were competing with their jobs. So what they do, the courts finally ended up saying, yeah, that's right, and took it out. So what happened? The legislature rewrote the law, and then they did it again. <laughs> That's how that works. The legislature gets to write the laws, and the courts get to decide what they meant. Anywhere there is not clarity. Now, if it's written out in plain English, X, Y, Z, then they're going to go, it meant X, Y, Z. But if not, then they're going to go off on a tangent. And if they're going to tell you what in their hearts they believe they meant, and that's a bad, bad thing to have a judge doing. Now, with respect to the case law, I'm, ca I'm quoting case law because, because when you go into a court and you argue anything and you say anything, you have to back it up with case law. You have to back it up with statute, with laws, with uh, constitutional provisions. I mean, if you're going into a courtroom, that's what you're going to want to do, right? And, but the primary thing you're going to see, you're going to say such and such and such did this and this is this case versus. That's how you're going to do it. Trust me. That is how it happens. So when I'm uh, quoting case law, the reason is because I'm verifying what's being said, what they are saying. Okay. So Staples versus United States 511 U.S. 600, which talks about the intent, the criminal intent of mens rea. It's right there for anybody to see. You can get on Cornell uh, University's website and find all of this stuff I'm talking about. So tell me I'm lying. Okay, it's the law university. It's Cornell Law School. All right, UC Berkeley. Any of them, Harvard, Yale, it doesn't matter. Look them up. Look up West Law, just like I told you. West Publishing Company. Look up West Law. Find Law. Type that in to Google. You can look up any case you want. Establishing the mens rea of an offender is usually necessary to prove guilt in a criminal trial. I just said that. And I'm sure people say that's not what it meant. They didn't mean it. The prosecution typically must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense with a culpable state of mind. That means you went in and you planned it. Or even if you didn't plan it, on the spot you decided you were going to do it. 
you knew it was a crime and you proceeded. That thought has to go through your mind or some form of it. Culpability. Justice Holmes famously illustrated the concept of intent when he said, quote, even a dog knows the difference between being stumbled over and being kicked, unquote. The man's real requirement is premised upon the idea that one must possess a guilty state of mind and be aware of his or her misconduct. However, a defendant need not know that their conduct is illegal to be guilty of a crime. Again, there's a difference. Did you hear what I said? They don't, they, you don't have to know that what you're doing is illegal for it to still be a crime, but you have to know you're doing wrong. It's conscience. Conscience is the eye of God and the mind of man. When you're doing something, you go, oh, and you got that twinge, and you know you're not supposed to do it. He's letting you know. That way you can't later say you didn't know any better. Your feelings are telling you. Your intuition, your God-given intuition is telling you. That's wrong. Don't do it. Don't do that. And then you do it anyway, and he's going to hold it against you. The judges are going to hold it against you if they can. Rather, the defendant must be conscious of the, quote, facts that make his conduct fit the definition of the offense, unquote. If a statute specifies a mental state or a particular offense, courts will usually apply the requisite mental state to each element of the crime. Moreover, even if a statute refrains from mentioning a mental state, courts will usually require that the government still prove that the defendant possessed a guilty state of mind during the commission of the crime. For example, the Supreme Court of the United States instructed that federal criminal statutes without a requisite mental state, quote, should be read to include only that mens rea, which is necessary to separate wrongful from innocent conduct, unquote. Mental states are usually organized hierarchically by the offender's state of blameworthiness. Generally, the blameworthiness of an actor's mental state corresponds to the seriousness of the crime. Higher levels of blameworthiness typically correlate with more severe liability, liability, and harsher punishments. Historically, states categorized mental states into crimes which required, quote, general intent and, quote, unquote, specific intent. However, due to the confusion that ensued over how to describe intent, most states now either use the Model Penal Codes, MPC, four-tiered classification, or the Malice Distinction. The MPC and mens rea, most states use the MPC's classification for various mens rea. The MPC organizes and defines culpable states of mind into four hierarchical categories. One, Acting purposely, the defendant had an underlying conscious object to act. You had an objective. You acted with an objective. Two, acting knowingly, the defendant is practically certain that the conduct will cause a particular result. He's doing it to get a result specifically. That result is what's going to get him booked because he knows it. He knows it's a crime. He knows the result itself is a crime. Acting recklessly, the, number three, acting recklessly, the defendant consciously disregarded a substantial and unjustified risk. Four, acting negligently, the defendant was not aware of the risk, but should have been aware of the risk. Thus, a crime committed purposefully would carry a more severe punishment than if an offender acted knowingly, recklessly, or negligently. The MPC greatly impacted the criminal codes of a number of states and continues to be influential in furthering discourse on mens rea. That ha mens rea has been uh, classified, it's been expanded. Um, the MPC has been expanded to cover uh, more types of mens rea, strict liability. Uh, things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's very simple. It means what it says. 
it's that guilty state of mind. You know it or you don't know it. And again, that's where conviction comes in too. You heard Paul say, these are my deeply held convictions. Not, not what he believes, but his convictions based upon his research and his studies and being able to read plain English. Okay, here's the Latin. Wait, is that, what does this mean? So what, what? But here's the English. Like I said, it's all convertible to English. It's all, and, and Latin is a very primitive language, just to be honest with you. If you look it up, scholars will tell you Latin is very primitive. It's very easy to translate Latin into English or any other language for that matter because it's a very primitive language. Ours are more complex and have more tools than theirs do. So it's easy to understand. We bring it right in. Intent. What does guilty mind mean? They could say mandria, but it translates what, uh, to guilty mind. But what does guilty mind mean? It means intent. Okay? Now, You only have the rights you are able to defend. you got to take that for what it is, or you're going to have a lot of problems. You're going to be highly disappointed along this path. You only have the rights you are able to defend. If you don't know how to defend your rights, you're not going to be able to defend them very effectively. Okay? So you need to know what your rights are, and you need to know how to use your rights and prosecute your arguments and presentments. Res is the, the real substance of a thing. This is a, a little bit more minor than the rest of this based on topic. I realize now, but the real substance of a thing, res, you know, like uh, let's say a deed technically should be uh, the real substance of a thing. The deed, the deed, the title representing the property or whatever else is on there, whether it's a house or, you know, that type of thing. Sorry, give me one second. All right, you know how computers can be. All right, according to the dictionary, it says res is a thing as property, interest, or status, as opposed to a person that is the object of the rights, and especially that is the subject matter of litigation. Sorry, I just wanted to look up one more thing for you, and that was res judicata as it uh, pertains to the res. And that is a matter that has been adjudicated by a competent court and may not be pursued further by the same parties. Okay, now, res judicata in this context prevents a party from bringing a claim once that particular claim has been subjected to a final judgment in some previous lawsuit. Essentially, they're saying you can't keep arguing something up and up and up and up. That's res judicata, but the, but the, root, word, the root word of res, again, di- distinct, uh, distinguishes the real substance of a thing from uh, the fictitious thing. So in this case specifically, res would have to do with um, you know, the flesh and blood individual would be the res, and the straw man would be, would be the front, would be what you see. That's the fictitious side of it. The real substance of the thing is you. It's your spirit. It's your conviction. It's your knowledge of these these various principles of commercial redemption, and it's your ability. It's your ability to defend your rights. That res right there is going to get you out of all types of situations. The res, when you go into the court and you have an issue and you want to go ahead and try to do that bond thing. And you want to try to get that bond released to you and say, I respectfully request in good faith that you release the bond uh, to the attorney in fact of so-and-so and believe the straw man. The bond is the res. You're not. The straw man is not. The case isn't. The true substance of the case is the bond. That's what they want. At the end of the day, I'm not saying some judges don't want to see you go to jail. Maybe all of them. 
I don't know. My honest opinion is that the judiciary in, 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 in its entirety is completely corrupt. I believe, that about, uh, I believe that about cops as well. I believe that the forces of law enforcement specifically are completely corrupt. And it's because they've been militarized. That doesn't mean that every cop is a POS. It doesn't mean that every agent of the machine is trying to hurt you. But they've been militarized. They're trained to look at you and believe that you are trying to manipulate them and that you pose a risk to them. That's how they're trained. Okay? To believe that about you, me, everyone. Public servant, peacekeeper, no, they're not anymore. Now they're law enforcement. Peacekeepers and cons even a constable today is not what a constable was back in the time of Wyatt Earp. Where they're requesting you to come with them so they can holler at you. No, today it's law enforcement and they're going to they're gonna snatch you up, kidnap you, and take you to jail. Right? I got off on a tangent, but the bottom line is... Res is the substance of the thing, that's you, flesh and blood. In a court situation, that's the bond, okay? Some people might, like I said, some of them might want to see you go to jail, but more of them want to see the money, okay? Let's say that you get arrested for something. It doesn't even matter what it is, but let's say something bad enough requires $50,000 bail. You get a bondsman. You say, I got, you know, whatever, I don't know how much they ask down, 5, 10, 15%. They, you say you have that plus a house. You're going to give them that. You're trying to get out. You don't want to stay in jail. You want to wait for your uh, court hearing um, free and with your family. So the bondsman says, okay, yep, here you go. And he issues the bond. He, you know, basically says, I can, you know, you're going to sign this security agreement. The security agreement says that if you uh, skip, uh, we're going to come after you. And we have basically any right at our disposal to get you we can physically apprehend you we can tie you up we can throw you in the trunk i mean there's an exhaust i don't know if it actually says that but it's an exhaustive list which will include jumping fences and things like that you saw dog the bounty hunter now a lot of that was fake but the principles behind bounty hunting are sound and you can look them up and in some states they're a lot more dangerous for you in any case he creates a bond he, he threatens you not, not literally but he says if you don't show up this is what we're going to do to you boom he gives you that. You sign the security agreement. He issues the bond. He gets him not a nice little pretty bond paper and, you know, nice design. He writes it out there and he writes the bond on it, says his company name. He goes and gives that to the court, okay? Just like you're going to do on your chargeback. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be professional. They're going to create that bond. They're going to give it to the court. You skip. You're gone. You're out of here. You're like, I, sorry, I heard what Reverend Ezekiel said and I ain't stepping foot in the courtroom. I'm kidding. But you do. You're out from when it's possible, you take off, boom, and the bond is cashed. He, that bond was real. He actually had that bond backed up like you have to with a bond. The, bond's all, the money's already available. Court takes that. He, they want that. They wanted it anyway. I mean, I take you to jail, but fine. Let's get the 50 grand. Skip. Beat it. It's no different than a loan on a vehicle. If you skip on, they're going to come get that vehicle back if they don't mind. So they're going to get that whole down payment again from somebody else, and then they're going to get the month, monthly payments again. If it happens again, they're getting another down payment and they're doing it again and again until that, until that vehicle's worth nothing, okay? So they don't care if you skip. They don't. They do not care if you skip. Court collects that 50 grand. The bondsman cares that you skipped. That bondsman is headhunting you, all right? And he wants to find you. But the beauty of it is that they're only giving him a grace period to recover his funds. After a certain amount of time, some places it's a year, some places it's more, you're going to have to look if that has anything to do with you at your state laws and state to state. But if he does not get you, if she does not get you before that time limit, they can't recover the bond anymore. The bond is gone. It's perfected. It's a lien. The court owns that money. If you ever show up around there again and you're arrested, you will be taken to jail. The warrant may never fall off depending on what the crime is. But that bondsman no longer has jurisdiction. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Look it up. They no longer have jurisdiction and the bond can no longer be recovered by them. Okay? The bond is the, is the res. Your flesh and blood body is the res, depending on the situation you're in. It's important to know that. It's important to know where you stand in the law and how important you really are and what value you have. Okay? You're the value behind everything. You are the bond. Your word is your bond. Remember all of that. Okay?
And remember that you live in a legislative, military, democracy construct. Okay, and what that means in context with this lesson today is that you live under colorable law. You will see the words time and time again, construe and construct. Okay? You know the words. When you construe something, right? Or you misconstrue something, you're essentially saying, essentially, definitions are not identical, but they're synonymous, that you understand, or it's an understanding of something, or you're creating a, 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 a perception of something, you're construing something, you're constructing something, you're building it out of the situation, on the spot. That actually, this whole concept, colorable, construe and construct, flies in the face of the doctrine of stare decisis, which means to stand by things previously decided. Construe and Construct says that they can do anything they want, when they want, on the spot, with no repercussions, total judicial immunity. Look it up. What? Just look up. What does Construe and Construct mean in the law? See what they say. And look up colorable. You know what colorable means. It means you can color whatever color you want. You can look at the picture. It's open. It's an open canvas. Just paint it. Draw on it. Do whatever you want. That's colorable. Do whatever you want. And that's not for you. That's for the judiciary. That's for the black robe priests of the Vatican. They get to do that with impunity. And tell children that were fortunate to go back to court and get what they were, what they had coming as a matter of their right. Tell them that they're going to give them a different sentence and a more extreme sentence based upon the fact that they couldn't give them even more time than that. Meaning standard range. They had to give them something in the standard range, so they literally gave them as much as they possibly could. It's despicable. It is. And they can do it all they want. And that same case can come before them and they decide different. Okay? They can, they can charge someone with viciously assaulting a small child. Okay? And they do it all the time. Let these people out with a slap on their hand and some supervision and a whole lot of protection. But tell a child that was trying to defend his girlfriend from an adult attacker that he's getting 18 years. No. That doesn't make any sense. It flies in the face of reason, but guess what it is? It's construe and construct. It's colorable law, and they have absolute immunity. Now, you can attack their bonds. You can go after them, but if you are in the wrong at all, they will book you. They will come for you, and they will crush you. And if you don't believe me, I wish you good luck, and God bless you, because you're going to have a lot of problems. But if you're right, you're in the right and they do some things that are wrong, then you can put a lien against their bond. You can make uh, strip them of their judicial immunity. But it is not easy. Okay? That Remember that attorney thing I talked about, like if you were in an accident where I said, it, it, you know, if I was paralyzed or I couldn't represent myself, that I might consider an, attor an accident attorney either out to get paid and that type of thing? There are situations where people are surrounded by attorneys that do their bidding, okay? There are people, right? You might not even see them, but that's what's happening, okay? And why are they doing it? To protect them from you. Those judges and things like that, they're sitting there, but they're attorneys and they're whole people. <clears throat> Everybody that they work with are all attorneys. We're on their way to be attorneys or are in the law field, to some degree, tax professionals, it's all the same. So when you go, okay, you know what, I'm going to go after this person, this judge, guess what they got? They, they got every person in the building at their disposal because everybody that works there is an attorney, a tax professional, whatever, they're all the same. Uh, judges are going to rule uh, in favor of other judges. They're going to claim that judicial immunity. They're going to claim you're a paper terrorist or some crazy stuff like that, and they're going to come after you. So uh, make sure you're in the right in a situation like that. If you go after a bond on a judge, they make sure that they actually harmed you and they caused you some reason to be able to go after them. Don't just go after them, all right? Normally the oath is their bond, 
but there are situations where there are actual bonds. Okay, HJR 192, what I mean by actual bond is a paper bond. HJR 192 is a bond. It's the supersidious bond. You've heard me say that. It's your bond to overcome pretty much any situation in commerce, but it's not an actual paper bond. You can create a paper bond based on HJR 192. I know you understand the difference, so let me get back to the judge. The oath of office is the bond, like your word is your bond. No, normally, what they're supposed to get a card or something in recognition of it that states their oath, and they normally would sign the back of it. There's also a, a, a contract, so to speak, a covenant uh, that they would sign, depending on the situation, of any state to state, whatever, county to county. But that card's the more common situation. That, com that card is the bond. It wouldn't be any different than uh, if you grab your insurance card out of your car uh, post-accident and handed it uh, to the person that you were in an accident with in order to exchange information. Okay, it's the same thing. It's just a card. It's a card. It's a bond. It's, it's your number. It's your guarantee. Okay? That's simple. So if you go after their bonds, what you're supposed to do is ask for their oath. If they didn't take an oath, they're not lawful anyway. They're not. And you need to write on that. That, that proves that jurisdiction. If you challenge their jurisdiction, and it turns out, and a lot of them do not have oaths signed. Even if they took the oath and they didn't sign it, the bond doesn't exist. They just verbally did it and, you know, and people, you know, okay, right, good, you're in. No, there has to be evidence. In a if you go online and you create a, and you do a credit card application and you get a credit card, they have you digitally signed. That's, that has no standing in law. If you challenge the signature, you can win that if it comes down to it. And the reason is because there's no blue ink signature. There has to be an actual signature at bank. You go in, you have a vehicle, and, and you are fortunate to have enough money or uh, backing to be able to buy a brand new vehicle from the car lot, okay? They're gonna, these days, they're gonna have you sign on a, this, their desk is gonna be a screen, like a Topaz signature thing. And you're gonna sign on that big glass screen, and that's not a signature that's binding by law. Now, they already have the money, you're not going to be able to get the money back, but it's still not a binding signature. The money's going to be gone. It would be no different if you got the money. If it was reversed, you get that money, cash that money out, that money's gone. There's no recourse, okay? They're doing the same thing. They're going to cash that out immediately, and that stuff's going to be gone. You're going to have some recourse under other things, like if the vehicle ends up being a lemon or not. But as far as the signature, that's not, but it, it doesn't change the fact that the signature wouldn't be binding if there was a way you could get the money, you could recover the money. There isn't going to be. Money's going to be gone. Okay? And a judge would say you can't use all this to weasel your way out of a contract. Right? Hale versus Hinkle applies that too, where uh, states can, uh, make no, can enact no laws that can uh, uh, prohibit or hinder the obligation of contracts. So if you enter knowingly, fraud aside, you knowingly enter into a contract, no problem, and then try to use this to get out of it, you're not getting out of it. It doesn't work like that. They're going to uphold the contract because you agreed to it. And there was no, no duress, no protest, nothing. All right, so that is what it is. I'm going to end this here. I think you guys got enough. I think you get the point. All right, foundation and all of this. Now, I want you to know that if you haven't joined L University, you should get in and join it. All right, you're going to have to fill out an application. And we're going to start the class February 6th. That, that doesn't mean that you can't get in that class later. You can, but you're just going to have to get caught up. Uh, it's at your own pace anyway. But you should definitely, at bare minimum, get on my Patreon and take a look at it. Even if you don't join us, just take a look at it. We're going to start doing some other things on there, too. We're going to start doing some live events right on it. So members of Patreon are going to be involved, included, right out. I'll be recording videos moving forward uh, where you can be involved interactively and we'll get those posted on YouTube. So come on over. If you want to look at uh, the Church of Sovereign Builders and what we're doing over there too, I'm about to put a whole bunch of information on there about that. And if you want to help us, if you want to um, help us get procure the land, build the church, it's going to be in Dallas, okay? It's going to be in the Fort Worth area. It's going to be beautiful. We already have our eye on some property. If you want to look at it, if you want more details about it, we'll include you. Everything's an open book here. Okay, so stay tuned, stay sovereign, do not consent.